Okay, so we've gone through the process and we found out our answer was 1420. Now, excuse me, let's go through the other process that we've, when we do it by hand, and just kind of understand what's happening. So now, the first thing, the first thing I want to point out is the, if you were to take this graph, these two graphs and, or these two equations and graph them, this is what you would get. And I kind of, fudged a little bit because um, I didn't want to make it to scale. But the idea is the the blue graph is graph A and the red graph is graph B. Okay. Now, if we were to start the problem, I want you to imagine starting at 0, 0 and you would test your your optimal value, test your, your uh, what you're maximizing. And you said, all right, right now I'm at 0, 0. So if I were to plug 0, 0 into x and y, I would get p equals zero, right? And that would be, um, well, not maximum. So then what you're gonna do is pick a direction. You're gonna say, I'm either gonna go to the corner point here on the x-axis, or I'm gonna go to the corner point here on the blue axis, on the y-axis. And you're gonna say, um, which one of these is better? Well, in the real world, I, what I want you to do is imagine you're standing at a mountain. Okay, and you're looking in the, the direction. Now, if your goal was to get as high as you can, because you're trying to maximize your height, would you you would want to pick the one with the steepest slope. You'd want to pick the one that, that was going uphill the fastest. Well, when you look at these slopes, you look at the slope here on the X and the slope on the Y, the X has a slope of rise two, run one. The Y has a coefficient of one, so it's rise one, run one. So the direction you're going to want to go is in the x direction because it has the steepest slope. Well, that's the logic we use on our pivot. Why we pivoted in the x column was because of the largest negative number. Well, this too was negative because we had subtracted it over to the other side. So we're using a little bit of backwards, you know, it, we're looking for the opposite of what we really want. We want the steepest slope, and right now that looks negative because we subtracted it to the other side. So that's the logic. Why we're picking the largest negative value is because what we're doing is looking for the steepest mountain. We're looking for the steepest slope, and that's the direction we're going to walk. So now we walk in the x direction, which means aka we, we walk, we walk, we walk until we get to this corner point, and then we pivot. Now in basketball terms, that means you stop and you look around. Right? So you've now reached kind of the peak of one of your mountains, and you're saying, okay, I am now here. Is this as high as I can go, or does my mountain keep getting higher somewhere else? And what we looked around is we stopped, we got to the, we went in this direction, got to this mountain, and said, oh wait, there's another way we can go that gets us even higher up there. So we looked around and we said, no, I need to keep going. I need to go in the Y direction. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's what pivoting is. That's what taking this value and getting zeros above and below is doing, is it's stopping and reorienting yourself, saying I am now standing at this point. I am now standing at one, two, three, four, comma, zero. Is that the best I can do, right? Now, what I will point out, here comes the fun part. The, when we learned how to read our answers, we said any value, any value in a column that has lots of numbers, throw it out, call that thing zero throw this out, call this thing zero. We'll get back to why that works in just a minute. But if we were to read this middle matrix that same way, I would keep my x's because there's lots of zeros and only one value. My y would get thrown out. My y would become zero. My q direction, which is a garbage variable, it's just a whatever, we'd keep that, right? My r we would throw out. My p, of course, we keep. We always keep it. And my equal sign we always keep. So if I were to read my answers right now, if I were to, to do this, now I, I don't want to scratch out these columns um, because I want to be able to reference, reference them for later, but if we were to read across right now, this first row would be saying what? Zero X's, zero Y's, two Q's, because remember it's zero Y's because Y equals zero. Um, so what we'd be saying is two Q's, zero R's, because remember R is equal to zero in this column. Um, zero P's equals 20. So therefore I would now be able to say Q equals 10. I don't really care. Q is, it's a slack variable. It really doesn't mean anything. Okay. Let's look at the other, let's look at the other row. This row here, all right, I keep my X's. So I'd say two X's, zero Y's. I, I'm keeping my Q's, but I have a zero there anyway, zero Q's. My R's are equal to zero. So throw that away. P is equal to zero equals eight. 
So therefore, I have x equals 4. Interesting. So we started off by saying y is equal to 0 because of lots of numbers and x equals 4. And remember how I told you we were walking in the x direction? Well, look where that corner point is. It's at 4, 0. And right now, this matrix is telling me if we were to stop right now, our answer would be x equaling 4, y equaling 0. Let's check our p really fast. So right now, what this is saying, check our bottom row. So 0 x's, y is equal to 0, so 0 y's, 0 q, r's get thrown out, so I'd just be left with p equals 8. So if I were to take the value of 4, 0, and sub that into my p equation, because p equals 2 x plus y, so I'd have p equals 2 times 4 plus 0, so that means p equals 8. So this is kind of one of the neat things about the about these matrices as we go through is they are literally walking you to a corner point. And then you are stopping and saying what x and y value am I at? And you can read it straight from the any matrix throughout the whole problem. And you can see, all right, right now I am at the value of 4, 0. And if I stop there, I would have a maximum of 8. But can I do better? All right, and then th we answered yes, we can do better because this negative two, this was still negative, and we'll get back to why that why that means that in a second. So we pivot again, and then we get to this and we read our answer. So now, if vi graphically you can see, all right, we are standing here. Where would be the next corner point we would go to on one of these paths? Well, we'd either go back to zero zero, which would not make sense, or we'd go all the way out to here where A and B intersect. And these are going to intersect, oddly enough, at 1420. So that would be our corner point. And you could find that by just by taking your A and your B from your original equations, and you could pop those in a matrix and do reduce threshold and form or something, and you would find out that they intersect at 1420. So if you take 14 and 20, you substitute those in. Um, let's see, so P equals 2 times 14 plus 20. So that would give us 2 times 14 is uh, 28 plus 20. Amazing that that gives us p equals 48, because what we already found is we have a maximum at 1420, and it gave us a max of 48. So there we go. Um, so nonetheless, whoops, I didn't want to do that. I want those answers back. Come back, come back, undo. There we go. OK, so now. The last bit of mysteries is what is going on? Why are we able to just scratch out these rows and make these things zeros? All right, so to do that, I'm going to zoom in here and get this a little bit bigger. Um, and this device doesn't have multi-touch, so I have to do it manually. There we go. All right, so you can see originally we had, uh, when we were doing this problem, we for our bottom row, we had x equals 0, right? y equals 0, so we didn't need any of that. And we our final equation would have been 4q's plus 3r's whoops, plus p equals 48. So then if I took this equation, because remember, when we first started, when we first took our original equation that we we're maximizing, we said the very first thing we we're going to do is take all of our variables and some, excuse me, and subtract them over to the other side. Well, because the logic is, is if you started looking at this could you have told me an x and a y value that would have made p as big as possible? Well, you would just say make x and y bigger, the, as big as they can get, and then p will keep getting bigger. Right? Logic, that's what it says. Well, now we have a better view of this. So what we're going to do is we're going to say p, we're going to put everything back into its original form. I'm going to subtract the 4q back over. I'm going to subtract the 3 bar r back over. So now, remember, our goal is to make p as big as possible. And because we have no negative variable, uh, no negative values in our objective equation, then that means we have no slopes that would be positive. We have no slopes that would continue us uh, in a direction going upward. And now that we've moved them back over, you can see the 4q direction is negative, the 3r direction is negative, which means both of these variables, if I pivoted in either of those directions, would be bringing us back downhill. So um, the logic here is, if I want p to be big as possible, and remember, all of our variables have the restriction that they all have to be greater than or equal to zero, 
What number would I substitute in for Q and R to make P have as big a value as I could possibly make it? Well, if I make Q equal to zero and R equal to zero, then what that does for me is makes P 48. Because if I make Q or R anything other than zero, if I made Q equal one, then I would have 48 minus four, and that would make me less than 48. So the best I can do, once I reach this in my objective equation where I have no negative values down here, I can scoot everything back over and say, any variable that's left, any variable that remains, that thing automatically becomes zero. Every variable that's left over, automatically has to be zero. And then that way, I am guaranteed to have as large a P as I can possibly have. So that's what's going on here. What we're really doing is just saying any variable that we didn't pivot for, any variable that doesn't have a zero, all zeros and a one, or all zeros and a number, it doesn't have to be a one, those things are the leftovers. Those are the things that are going to bring our P value down. So therefore, all of those automatically just get set equal to zero. And there you go. So that's where that part of the process came from. So I hope this helps a little bit. Oh, there's one thing I forgot to mention. I apologize. What on earth is it with that smallest ratio of the, of the values? What the heck is that? All right, so let's take a quick look back here. Let's take a quick look. Let's go back to the first one where we said, all right, largest negative value. And then I take my, my equal sign divided by my x. So that would be 6 divided by negative 1 and 8 divided by 2. Well, if you stop and think about it, what we're really doing is saying walk in the x direction until you run into one of your equations, right? So what we're saying is if I go to the right, I walk into the number 4. If I go to the left, I'm going to walk into the number negative six. Interesting. So the idea here is why are we picking the smallest positive ratio? Well, the smallest one means it's just the first x-intercept I'm going to run into. So if I had another graph that was out here, maybe, I don't care. That's not my shaded region. So ignore it. I want the first equation I run into, not the last. So that's why I'm going to keep the four. Then it has to be positive because we already know from simplex all of my variables have to be greater than or equal to zero. So therefore, if I don't want to go in the negative direction because those aren't in my shaded region anyway, it's not a point I want to test. It's not a corner point I need to walk to. So that's what's going on with this. So what you're actually doing is just finding x-intercepts. Because when we know um, we're walking to an x-intercept, we know all of our other variables are zero. So therefore, let y be 0, let q be 0, let r be 0, let p be 0. So what we're really just saying is 2x equals 8. And if I solve for that, that gives me x equals 4. That's what's going on with the ratio. It's just a quick way of saying find your x-intercepts. So in the next one, we were finding y-intercepts. In the green in our second matrix, we were saying we're pivoting in the y column, so find me all the y-intercepts. So you could say, all right, x is 0, q is 0, r is 0, p is 0. So therefore, I get, whoops, excuse me. So therefore, I get y equals 20, or it's the same logic of just saying, what's 20 divided by 1? Well, that's 20. And then what is 8 divided by negative 1? Excuse me. That's negative 8. So therefore, the y-intercept here is in the negative 8. This one is positive 20. I'm going to go to the positive 20. That's it. That's the big ideas. Um, so I, I hope it helps you kind of remember what's going on. So as we go through these problems, the first thing we're doing is picking the largest slope. Right? We're looking for the most lar largest negative number because that's the steepest hill. Then we're going in this column. How do we pick our pivot? We're looking for in that direction. We're looking for the first x-intercept we run into. And we find that just by doing the ratios. Then once we walk to that point, we stop and check. We're going to look around and say, is there anywhere else we, could, we can still keep going uphill? So we look around and say, are there still any negative slopes? Yes, there's uphill. So we're going to pivot again. So we go to the y direction, we find the first y-intercept, and then we stop and we ask ourselves, are there any more uphills? Nope, these were downhill, this was downhill. So therefore, now we read our answers by letting q's be 0, r be 0, to give us the largest positive possible p, where p is equal to 48. Um, and then you read off your x and your y. Okay, I hope that explanation just helps you understand what's going on.